Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the rugged and remote peaks of the Teton Wilderness of northwestern Wyoming. We visited this area in a previous episode, so if it seems familiar, it should. On the slopes of 10,258-foot-high Terrace Mountain is where our incident takes place, among pine and fir stands, with creeks lined with willow bushes. Yes, there are a lot of elk, moose, and mule deer roaming this area, but the most dangerous of its inhabitants are the grizzlies. On Thursday, September 13, 2018, Wyoming outfitter Mark Upton was guiding a client of his, Corey Chubon, on an archery elk hunt. Corey had come up from Florida after booking his hunt with Martin Outfitters out of Moran, Wyoming, about 20 miles south of Yellowstone National Park. They'd seen a lot of promising sight in the area, and the rut was well underway. For those of you who may not be familiar with the term rut, it means the mating season for elk. During this time, the bulls bellow long, high-pitched screams that echo down valleys and across ridgetops for miles. The bulls use these calls, known as bugles, to locate each other and rivals as well, and even assess the age and aggression of each other. Younger bulls will typically have higher and shorter bugles, while older bulls will sound raspier and even have chuckles at the end that sound as if they're laughing at their rivals. Bulls can be called in by emitting a unique sound similar to what a female, or cow, elk will make. It is higher pitched but more short in duration. Not only rival bulls use these bugles to locate each other, but hunters use them too to find where the elk they are hunting are located. Elk hunters will mimic these mating calls with various devices to locate or even call in a lone bull seeking to challenge a herd bull for his harem of cows. In previous episodes on this channel, we've discussed brown bears learning to mimic the call of mating moose, and there's strong evidence that they also use elk bugles to home in on elk as well, though they're not known to mimic the bugles. On our episode on this channel called The Archery Elk Hunt Grizzly Ambush of Ronnie Leeming, we discussed this very behavior, and after you watch this episode, check that one out too. It takes place in this same area. Mark and his client, Corey Chubon, had found some luck when they located and stopped a beautiful 4x4 bull. This bull had a tall, ivory-tipped rack of points with four tines proudly jutting from each main beam, and Corey decided it was well worth his tag. The men crept upon the bull, and Corey's arrow hit pay dirt and seemed to pierce the bull's lungs. The men followed the blood trail for quite a while before twilight signaled closing time for the day of hunting. The men agreed to come back and resume following the blood trail in the morning. The following day was Friday, September 14th, and the hunters immediately scurried back to the blood trail to continue pursuing the wounded bull. In elk hunting, it isn't uncommon for a wounded bull or even a cow to run quite a distance after being shot. The conventional wisdom is to sit down for at least 30 minutes or so to let the animal bleed out. If you rush to follow the blood trail, you may end up bumping it from its bed, where it's bleeding, and force it to run to another location, which can lead to the animal getting lost or even make it stop bleeding altogether due to the tissues around the wound shifting and closing off bleeding roots from the wound. The hunter's patience paid off, as after resuming where they left off, they found the bull dead just below a clearing. They carefully inspected the area around the dead bull and didn't see any sign of a bear visiting the carcass in the night, so they felt confident that they were not intruding on a bear food cache. Mark carried his bear spray on his hip in a holster as a precaution anyway, but it appeared they wouldn't need it. They wasted no time field dressing the bull and preparing the 220 pounds or so of meat for packing, and Mark carefully set his Glock pistol he carried on his hip a few yards above the carcass. To field dress an animal, a hunter takes a knife and cuts down the middle of the lower portion of the animal's body and through the layer of muscle into the gut. Through that opening, the organs and guts are removed, and other steps are taken to cool the meat to prevent bone sour or outright rot. The fall is usually left aside for scavengers to consume, but it can be an invitation for more than crows and coyotes. The men worked hard packing out the quarters of the elk's carcass and tying them up in a tree to cool. As it hung, the hunters returned to the remnants of the carcass to recover the hide and antlers. As the men surveyed the carcass and briefly considered the chore ahead, a thunderous racket of brush popping across the clearing above them drew their eyes up the hill. To their horror, a large grizzly bear was closing in on them at full speed, eyes fixed on them as she came. As she closed in on the men, she focused on Mark first. 
She tackled him to the ground as Corey fled uphill to grab the Glock on the backpack. As the bear wrestled Mark, Corey pointed the pistol at the bear and waited for a clear shot on the beast. When a good opportunity presented itself, he pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. He fussed with it a bit and aimed again, but it still didn't fire. To anyone unfamiliar with a Glock pistol, they have three built-in safeties. The first is the drop safety, which keeps the firing pin from firing sequential rounds without a trigger pull. The firing pin safety, which mechanically blocks the firing pin from moving forward. And the trigger safety, which features a discrete lever incorporated into the trigger. Each of these mechanisms is countered by the pull of the trigger safety. The trigger safety must be depressed before the trigger is pulled, or the gun will not fire due to the redundancy of the other mechanical safeties designed into the pistol. It is an ingenious and very safe design feature, but to anyone unfamiliar with the proper discharge of the firearm, it may prevent them from shooting the pistol. The grizzly then turned her attention toward Corey. As she turned in his direction, Corey attempted to toss Upton the pistol. Unbeknownst to Corey and Upton, the pistol fell uselessly only a few feet down the hill and out of his range and awareness. The enraged sow knocked Corey to the ground and began to chew up and claw at his chest. As he kicked and punched at her, she clawed and bit his legs and arms as well. By now, Upton had made it back to his feet, which drew the sow's attention. She turned away from Corey and quickly began attacking Upton once again. This gave Corey a chance to run away. As he ran up the hill toward the racked-up horses, he looked back in Upton's direction. He could see Mark standing on his feet trying to fend off the sow's attack. Corey sprinted up the mountain and jumped on one of the horses. He urged the horse on to the ridgeline of the 10,000-foot-high Terrace Mountain. He pulled out his cell phone and surprisingly received a signal. Authorities immediately dispatched a rescue copter to pick him up. The rescue team flew the helicopter to the location of the carcass after Corey described where the incident occurred. They found the elk carcass around 7 p.m. and given there was only an hour or so of daylight and very little flight time left on the helicopter, decided to return at sunup on Saturday. When the rescue team returned to the location, they found a drag trail leading down the hill from the carcass. Believing it was from Upton's body, they followed it, only to find out that it was from the afall of the elk rolling down the hill. Near the elk carcass was a confusing scene indicative of a struggle. There was blood and debris obviously disturbed all around the immediate area, but some of that evidence was from the elk dying, the men gutting the animal, and from the struggle with the grizzly. The elk's blood trail crisscrossed with blood from the men, and it led to a moderate amount of confusion. It took a while for all the evidence to make sense, but the rescue team eventually found Upton's body 50 yards uphill from the carcass. Due to the fact that there was no drag trail up to where they found Upton's body, the team concluded that he was still able to walk about 50 yards up the hill after the initial attack, and found his way there for the fatal second attack from the sow. Judging by the fatal wounds on Upton's body, the investigator concluded that his death at the second attack site was very quick. The sow, or her one-and-a-half-year-old cub, had bitten Upton's head, which caused his immediate death. His body had severe trauma inflicted upon it during the two attacks, but the bears left his body intact. They did not eat any part of Mark Upton's body. The empty can of bear spray Upton carried on his hip was found near his body. His Glock pistol was located downhill from Upton's final location, but uphill from the elk carcass, an initial attack scene. Given its final location, it appeared that Upton somehow recovered the pistol, only to lose it somehow, in his uphill climb toward the location of the final attack. Shortly after finding Upton's remains, Wyoming Game and Fish carnivore biologists placed three leg hold snares around the attack site. By Sunday morning, the investigative team landed a helicopter. As soon as they walked a short distance, they could hear the bawling of a bear caught in one of the foothold traps. They knew by the sound that they had snared the cub, which would mean the sow may be nearby and in a less than cordial mood after listening to her youngster holler. In an attempt to observe the snared cub safely, the investigative team tried to approach from an open angle with less cover. Given that grizzly sows are extremely protective, she was waiting up for them and heard them approaching her snared cub. She didn't hesitate to charge the five well-armed men. But when she could finally see how many people there were, she paused for a brief moment. The team took the opportunity to quickly discuss if they should shoot her or not. The decision was made by Officer Dan Thompson to take her. 
The four armed men in the group fired numerous rounds, dropping the protective sow in her tracks. The officers began their investigation of her and found her stomach to be full of elk meat. Her paws matched the tracks at the elk carcass, and the smell of bear spray could be seen and felt only a short distance from her. The team figured out that the bear spray Upton carried on his hip was not discharged in the initial attack, most likely due to how quickly it happened. They determined that the bear spray was deployed by Upton at the second attack site, where he received the fatal injuries that took his life. They collected her DNA to submit to the lab for analysis back in Laramie. After analysis of the 10-year-old, 250-pound sow, she was found to be very healthy with no apparent injuries or impairments. She had plenty of fat on her and was described as being in good shape. The cub was about 150 pounds and was sedated before being removed from the snare. Officer Thompson again made the call to kill the cub. It would later be revealed in Upton's autopsy that the cub had participated in killing him. Officer Thompson later said that the yearling cub was involved in the attack and contributed to the death of Mark Upton. He also stated that he had never dealt with a sow and a yearling cub attacking in this manner. He commented, as well, that the investigators could not agree with the idea that Upton discharging his bear spray during the second attack did no good. An important point that the state biologists pointed out was that the bears were not returning to a kill. They were not acting in defense of a carcass they were claiming. They also point out that the cub was a safe distance away from the men and was not in any danger nor being threatened by them. Nonetheless, the sow charged the men and attacked without hesitation. This is beyond rare behavior and very unusual. Officer Thompson said that the hunters were doing nothing wrong in their recovery of the elk carcass. They followed the best practices for hunting in grizzly country. He also indicated that killing the cub was the right thing to do because the sow had taught him that killing humans is a potential way to get food. Bears have remarkable memories when it comes to how they acquire food, and a cub who has shown any lesson will retain and use it in the future. Wyoming Game and Fish officials did not try to capture nor kill those bears, simply because their behavior didn't warrant it. They acknowledged that this type of bear behavior is something that cannot be ignored in this environment. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.